like Chekhov's gun, regional manager Dwight, was foreshadowed long, long ago. Anxiety inducing for those who watch this for the first time and painful for series veterans, we have no choice but to sit here and just let it happen. That's right, today we are looking at Dwight Schrute, acting manager, the penultimate episode of season seven of The Office, and it's a doozy. Let's go. I understand nothing. With D'Angelo Vickers on coma life support, some of the staff try to identify the right gift to leave for him. This kind of sets up the shtick of the episode. You have everyone who sees things, quote, normally, and then you have Dwight. All in favor of the knapsack filled with canned goods, chainsaw, gasoline, and emergency radio in case he wakes up post-apocalypse. Referencing The Walking Dead aside, the rest of the cold opening shows how well The Office actually works without the need for any oversight at all. Now, it was at this point that I kind of got an Old West vibe from this episode. <laughs> you know, the movies that make it seem like everyone was just shooting up everybody all the time back then and everything was just bonkers and lawless. But you know, it seems like that's not exactly how things were back then. Just people doing their thing in relatively loose oversight. Until, that is, the power dynamics are interrupted. Jim, for some reason, rejects Joe's offer to stand in as temporary manager. I think we can all agree. Like, there's nothing I think 100% of humans can agree on. But this, it feels like it's something we should all be able to unanimously have a consensus on. There's no way that Jim would have turned down this offer. Well, maybe on top of the salary cap, you know, like that might have still been a factor. But I think we can all agree there's no way this is the reason. I don't want to mess this up, right? There's a consensus. People are happy. That's a no for me, dog. There's no way. Maybe some hippie utopia honeymoon thing that he's experiencing, but it's not realistic. At the very least, the third in command is Dwight, making this moment the real catalyst of the episode. Dwight Schrute. I think, by the way, we can even make this a little bit more dramatic. Jordan, gather my things from my desk. Rose, you'll never guess where I am right now. Again, Dwight taking over the manager role very much is giving me the vibe that there's a new sheriff in town. There's a new sheriff here in these offices, and his name is me. Back from the opening credits, Dwight has enacted a pretty strict management style, which is juxtaposed to the freestyle the office has experienced since the Vickers dunk. Things like the morning recital of the Pledge of Allegiance. They still do that in schools, by the way? I don't know. Leave a comment. Uh, he also enacts cost-saving measures like printer codes. And my God, I hate these things so much. Thankfully, like my office has this badge system, but for some reason, it doesn't work for me, so I still have to hand key in my username and password every time I want to use the machine. And the touchscreen isn't that sensitive, so it's kind of a delay. And sometimes you don't know if you hit the button or if it's just a delay. So you hit it again, but then as you're typing, the rest catches up and it adds an extra letter in there. <laughs> Dwight's also replaced the break room vending machine items with adverts to shop at his overpriced caffeine corner. Then there's the decor. Dwight's office alone is fantastic, with weapons on top of weapons on top of weapons. The flesh-eating fish and the white tiger painting are also fantastic additions. The desk of Saddam Hussein's nephew was a bold play back in 2011 at least. Hi Ryan, this is Saddam Hussein! It's in line with the dictatorial style of painting that's in the bullpen, something we even see a different iteration of it late in season 9. Leaders like this attempt to create a cult of personality of sorts by showing off the items that they could use to murder you. Just like D'Angelo's juggling routine before, we could see how people are reacting to Dwight's leadership. Mix in with their feelings about the pledge itself a little bit. Angela's super on board. Oscar's the focus of this moment. One nation under God. Don't think I ever noticed Creed back there looking like he's praying. This sequence fantastic. We even get another one later, but we're going to get to that in a minute. It's at this point the episode diverges into two side plots. First is Jim's faux revolution. You expect me to believe that you're starting a rebellion? Nope, social club. God, I hate when everybody calls us a rebellion. From what I can tell, this plotline was maybe most impacted by the cuts made to this episode to get it to fit into the 22 minute time slot. And that's because this conversation with Jordan goes nowhere. It goes nowhere because the rest of this content was cut for this episode. 
something I think the super fan cut will probably restore. Beyond that, the B-plot focuses on Andy, Gabe, and Aaron's love triangle. Well, I don't care for any of this plot line at all because it feels so inconsequential. I'm going to give credit where it's due. Woods is working it pretty good in this episode and Kemper is straight up killing it. She's always been the quirky girl used for dumb jokes with a few moments of depth here and there, but something about Kemper's performance is elevated in this episode and it's fantastic. The end of the second act of this episode has Dwight being gifted a gun holster. Now I'm from Missouri and I assume everyone is packing all the time everywhere. I'm not, but like that's not an invitation. Don't come and get me. But I do know my way around guns. I come from a long line of hillbillies and I've spent plenty of time behind a firearm. And this isn't just your normal Chekhov's gun moment. The hammer is pulled back. That's extremely dangerous. It's even still pulled back when he's handling it in the bullpen. Terrible trigger discipline and it really should have never happened. I think people love this episode for Dwight's meteoric ascension, his dominating leadership, and then the depths at which he falls. Me, I'm actually still just confused why this happened in the first place. Nonetheless, there's a lot going on during this moment. It's so easy to miss that with no communication whatsoever, Creed immediately came and collected the weapon from a very shook Dwight. I don't know why this happened, but I love it. And then moments later, the pistol is sitting on Andy's desk, which is also a great moment. I also noticed for the first time, Ryan is hiding behind Kelly. Daryl takes the partially deafened Andy to the ER to get checked out. What's wrong with you? It's my ear. Yeah. And reaching hardcore, Dwight attempts to put on his best Michael impersonation in order to win back the affections he never really had in the first place. And the staff are not on board. They generally don't have Dwight's back until he begins to make compromises with his leadership. This is when the episode turns from cartoony commentary of leadership politics into something that's honestly kind of interesting. When Joe arrives with two completely different dogs, by the way, this time, she makes three sexual jokes in less than a minute. Nobody let my dogs hump each other. They don't seem to know they're brothers. Just like a man wants to jump right into it while I still got my socks on. Jim Halpert, the only man to ever turn me down. I don't really think that matters. I just thought it was odd. We've talked about this before, but Joe's management model, at least how I see it, is very much don't poke the fish because you'll ruin it style. So this meet and greet with Dwight was absolutely his end to going back to the printer and getting a plaque which doesn't say Iterum on it. However, after seeing that he's completely lost all of his authority with his people, he decides to fess up over the shooting. Joe, I accidentally fired a gun in the office today. What? For me at least, this isn't too dissimilar from this moment. Angela's having sex with Dwight. There's a lot of power dynamics at play here with this idea that the truth will set you free, that Dwight could not lead from his Bond villain level of authority if his people were simply to circumvent his leadership. And the sentiment is kind of admirable. Managing you for this last week has been the greatest honor of my life. And if you ruin this, I will burn this office to the ground. I mean, in reality, these people would eventually lose interest in holding something over Dwight's head as long as he doesn't push the bound of his leadership too hard. I totally forgot about the affair for a minute. <laughs> Josie's fit to strip Dwight of his badge and duties until further notice, and the office instills the senior most employee to lead operations until a new manager has been found, leading to one of my favorite non-Michael moments of season seven. And I think that is shagadelic, baby. The dialogue here feels real and touching, with the realization that Creed has taken over as manager being revealed in the same shot. I don't know if it was written this way or if it was a directing decision, but I love it. I've thought a lot about the deeper meaning of the Dwight K. Schrute acting manager episode, so let's talk about that in the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. Continuing its commentary on bad management styles, the office asks the question, what if the weird guy in the office becomes the manager? Dwight's had brushes with becoming manager in the past, going all the way back to season three. His career aspirations have always been pretty clear. We got a taste of what a Dwight-led office would look like back in the job. Anyone who comes in here is gonna have to take me seriously. 
Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. It's great actually that Andy was helping him out back in that episode because I noticed in Dwight K. Schrute acting manager episode, Andy's dressed up kind of like an Andy version of Dwight. The short sleeve button up shirt is a very Dwight-esque at least. Either way, now with the manager office all to himself, he's drunk with power. Something that Dwight hasn't quite comprehended about leading people is that he's, you know, leading people. And that's kind of a problem for Dwight because he hates people. Well, at least most people, and he doesn't have very many people's skills. I think, you know, he's said as much in the pilot, if I'm remembering that right. I've been recommending downsizing since I first got here. I even brought it up in my interview. Okay, not exactly, but it is show that Dwight doesn't really care about his coworkers too much. And that is a theme we've seen before. The thing with Dwight is that he carries over his farmer mentality into the workplace, which might work well for sales, but isn't working for leading people. And working with livestock, it is important to understand how to work with them, how to manipulate them into doing and going where they want, and you don't have to worry about their feelings. But you also need to know when to let the animal go. The thing with humans are, like, we're way more complicated, and Dwight is not cut out for this at all, at least not now. To Dwight, if he can muster all of a show of force, he can. That's all he needs to do to keep his people corralled. The weapons, while obviously a joke about how Dwight is trying to foment all the cool points he can get. Define foment. You define foment. Is also intended to reinforce the antiquated outlook on managing people. So is this time clock, by the way. All of it comes down to control. This episode is going out of its way to demonstrate why this approach doesn't work in the modern office place. First, when it's all about Dwight, it's all about Dwight. He's drunk with power and isn't thinking through the implications of his actions. He orders a desk, brings in all this decor, enacts all this change, and he's not even certain he's got the job. He's so brash to look cool in a way that really only he would think looks cool. And when the office pushes back against the clear and present danger of having a loaded gun in the workplace, something I'm actually now just remembering that Michael had. I have a loaded gun in my desk at work. And if I ever start acting like that weenie Gabe, I want you to take that gun and I want you to shoot me like a hundred times. But I'm sure that was just a coincidence. Either way, when the office pushes back on Dwight, he's still so determined to look cool, he handles this weapon foolishly. Sorry, I freaked you guys out. When it's about you, it makes you a bad leader. Leading like this creates a gap between you and the people you're trying to lead. This episode comments on this by demonstrating that Dwight's actions absolutely have earned him no loyalty from the office staff. And in some cases, Dwight's call to follow fall on deaf ears. Bad puns aside, I think that's the point here. It's hard to see Dwight get everything he's wanted and almost in a biblical way fall so hard from grace. But with that, let's rate this thing. This is the worst. Right, so the cold opening on the reels, only one change, and I think we've fixed the entire starting point of confusion that I have with this episode. Cut this. Well, I really appreciate the offer, but I'm just happy the way things are. It goes straight into this. Dwight Schrute. And then having a talking head with Jim, in which he says, when he asked Toby why he wasn't offered the position based on his past experience, Toby says, oh, Joe assumed you didn't want the position because you gave it back to Michael so willingly. I really, really think Michael is better at being manager for so many reasons. Mm. This is believable, it's simple, it maintains a consistent continuity. There's nothing wrong with this cold opening. And actually, the first time watching it, I probably didn't have this problem with it at all. I was just as I'm sure many of you were, in a state of bewildered shock. Much like Moe's. Ah! Either way, I think it's an effective cold opening to the story of this episode, so I'm gonna give it a low four out of five. Well, what can you do, life? As for this episode, buddy, this is ranked as one of the top episodes of season seven. I even put it on my list of top episodes after Corel departs, but watching and analyzing it for this field guide, I'm gonna be honest, I'm kinda struggling. I battle with this one because I think I'm falling prey to something I've criticized other critics for. And that's that it's not the story I wanted them to tell. Dwight is an interesting character. And if you look at it as one step in a long journey of him eventually taking over the office, then my reading goes way up. 
But if it's just a hey, let's have fun with answering the question of what happens when you put the weird guy as manager. Dwight doesn't trust robots to give us our messages. With a clear logical conclusion is that he'll almost commit manslaughter. I'm not super on board for that. Personally, I've always felt like this was the latter. I've always felt like this was a filler episode in a time when we didn't need a filler episode. We needed a clear trajectory from how do you get from Corel to what the future of the office is going to be. Now I say all of that, but I'll give that this filler is full of shock and awe. What the f is that? Oh my. With some exquisite shots and the redemptive moments between Dwight and Jim, and the plenty of good bits and funny jokes, it's objectively good television. So again, I think my distaste is just one that's biased on how I wanted these post-Michael episodes to play out. So that aside, I think I'm gonna give this one a low four out of five as well. But that's just what I think about Dwight Schrute, acting manager. Anything I missed, leave it in the comments. I wanna hear what you guys have to think about this episode and this field guide or whatever else in the comments. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.